CityCast from Explicity. My name is Charles Sobraj. You might have heard of me, said the voice on the phone. My secretary had passed on the call, saying this person had called 10 times and she had warded him off. But he was dogged about wanting to speak to me and wouldn't tell her what it was about. He had finally told her it was personal and urgent, so she thought she'd better put him through. I took the call. There was Charles Sobraj identifying himself on the phone. You're the serial killer, I said, hesitating before using the phrase. Should I be diplomatic, use a euphemism? The hell with it, I thought in that instant. I'll see if he acknowledges such a description. The game was on. He drew breath the other end and picked up the glove. You could put it that way, he said. So many encounters later, I would learn that he not only acknowledged the description while never admitting or confessing to killing anyone, he was proud of it. He would say, people, even criminals, respect me for being a super criminal. On that first phone call, I was naturally curious as to why this notorious character was calling me. Are you speaking from jail? I asked. No, no, that is all over. I'm in Paris and completely free. But I need your help. You see, like you, I'm a writer. Now listen. You were with my cousin Ram Advani in college in Pune, and then you were both writing for the Pune Herald. You remember? His accent was a caricature French, with the eyes becoming E, and the emphasis on syllables going haywire. And my cousin said, you were the best man in Europe to help me. How can I help you, I asked curious and feeling lucky. It was as though a subject for a surefire TV program had walked through the door. He had killed people in Thailand, India and Nepal. Maybe in Pakistan, Iran, Greece and Turkey in the 1970s. Audience memories are short, but a confession would jog them. Did he want to confess? Most people know who Charles Sobraj is. But even if Sobraj has become something of a legend, he was, by many accounts, a thief and murderer after petty gains and not an international crook engaged in high-profile art and diamond heists, nor an international arms dealer whose shenanigans got the collective undies of nations in a twist. Or was he? My guest today, the renowned writer Farooq Dondi, spent considerable time with Charles Sobraj. Farooq's descriptions of his meetings with Sobraj resulted in his latest book, Hawk and Hyena. The book reveals another aspect of Sobraj, that of an opportunist, a wannabe businessman. One of those guys that we have all met, a person of indeterminate skill and dodgy provenance, never peddling the same thing twice. Importantly, the book raises a startling question. Did Charles Sobraj hold the key to a potentially unpalatable truth, that maybe Saddam Hussein did have weapons of mass destruction after all. In another similar question, did the government of India seek the assistance of Charles Sobraj in securing the release of the hostages from the hijacked Indian Airlines plane in 1999 in Kandahar? Was Charles Sobraj more than a mere small-time crook who seduced hippie chicks, liberating them from life and lustrous diamond? Hawk and Hyena by Farooq Dondi raises those questions and answers many. This book is only his latest offering in a fascinating life of journalism, TV shows, films, plays and books, and political activism. He was a Marxist and a member of the British Black Panthers. There's a link to his Wikipedia page in the podcast description. Here's another book that I'd recommend, Fragments Against My Ruin, Farooq Dondi's memoirs and autobiography if you like. This book is a riot, from a humility that can only come from someone inherently funny and inherently capable, Farooq Dondi turns important incidents into escapades and wit to wackiness. My own introduction to his writing was from the columns that he wrote and writes in various newspapers. He frequently opened with the line, as an elder of the community, I am often asked. <laughs> For many reasons, I found that line delightful. 
Some years ago, her friend brought Farooq to my office in an unplanned visit and neither of us can remember why. We had coffee. I was happy for the social surprise, but I had no idea what to say to him, if only because I had too much to say to him, and I had been blindsided. Happily, that is not the case today. It is both an honour and a privilege to have him join us from his home in London. Farooq Dondi, welcome to the Literary City. Thank you. It's an honour for me to be here. As an elder of the community, are you often asked where one might read your columns? Well, um, I used to write that as a kind of jocular line. In the Several columns I've written for different newspapers. I used to write for a, a newspaper called DNA, and I called my column Double Helix, but I don't think they got it. <laughs> in, in in the Asian Age and Deccan Deccan Chronicle, I still write. Um, I still write every week. It's published on Saturdays. It's called Of Cabbages and Kings, but I don't begin that column with as an elder of the community. <laughs> <laughs> How did Charles Sobraj react to your characterizations of him variously, from a moral existentialist to a pest? Uh, you know, he hasn't reacted to Hawk and Hyena yet. Oh, My okay. feeling is that he will appreciate this book and ignore all the negative business because, um, I'll tell you what the evidence for that is, when when a, 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 a serial called The Serpent was on mm -hmm. BBC and Netflix, um, a journalist called Andrew Anthony from The Observer, went to Kathmandu mm -hmm. to talk to him in right, jail. Right. And he told all these incredible stories to Andrew Anthony. And then Andrew said, I don't believe you or some such. And um, Sobraj said, if you don't believe me, go and speak to a fellow called Farooq Dhondi in London. So Andrew mm -hmm. Anthony came to me and said he spun, Sobraj spun all these stories about CIA, this, that, and the other. And oh, I right. said, yes, it is true. I did introduce him to a colleague of mine who'd written a, a book on the history of the CIA. And so mm -hmm. um, perhaps uh, what Sobraj wants is the substantiation of certain facts which might get him released. So I don't know whether he'll object to this book at all. An earlier book, I wrote a fiction called mm -hmm. The Bikini Murders. The, the Bikini when, Murders, yeah. When the That was a fictional account of right, somebody. Right. I didn't call him Sobraj. Uh, mm -hmm. I called him Johnson Tart. But, uh, right. uh, I mean, the, the book explains why. But when the book came out, all the Indian newspapers and foreign newspapers said, uh, in reviewing it, this is all about Charles Sobraj. Then right. a gentleman called, um, what was his name, Arunab Goswami, mm -hmm. uh, a questioner on, on television, called me and said, Farooq, can we review your book on television? I said, fine, you know, anything to get some publicity. So okay. I appeared on his program. And after mm -hmm. asking me a few questions and saying some decent things about the book, Mr. Goswami said, I've got a little surprise for you. and." Um, he switched on uh, some switch. The camera went to Kathmandu jail to Sobraj. Really? Yep. And Sobraj says uh, that this is terrible. What he's written is all about me. And I'm going to sue him for a million dollars, this, that, and the other. Wait a minute. He identified himself as a character in the exactly. book. Exactly. That's what I said to him. Uh -huh. I said, I haven't used your name. But if you think that this is yourself and you're guilty of these 11 or 12 murders that I put down there, well, it's mm -hmm. up to you. Come to court and say, I'm the one who's uh, murdered all these people. Uh, and he tried to say that, uh, he said, this folk, this, this, this folk, don't, he's a, and he was about to say pimp. When the producer uh -huh. said, you can't say that on, on, um, uh, on NDTV or whatever it was. And he said, uh, he's a middleman, he's a middleman. So I got what he was trying to say. So I said to him, listen, if Nelson Mandela called me a pimp, I'd be very offended. But you can say what the fuck you want. <laughs> right? Then Goswami played another trick, 
right? Which is which was he turned the camera to Paris, where there was uh -huh. this young lady, well, not very young, who said, "I am uh, Sobraj's lawyer, right? Right. right. And oh. I'm going to sue Mr. Dhondi and the publishers for every cent that they've got." I said, good luck. I haven't got many cents at all, right? <laughs> I don't own any property. The bank balance is a bit in, in the red. So go for it. Um, but then I said to Goswami, I said, do you know who this woman is? She was the one who's married to the jackal, the jackal ah. terrorist in jail. And so she's married him in absentia, as it were. And also, she represented Slobodan Milosevic and other... Really? Regions. Yes. And now she's representing Charles Sobraj, so he's in very good company. Well, if you must get a lawyer. <laughs> how did Charles Sobraj's betrayal of Masood Azhar not have consequences for him? And anyway, what was that connection? Um, see, I don't think Masood knows that he was betrayed. He got released in, in the hostage crisis of the Indian Airlines um, hijacking was right, from right. Uh, um, Kathmandu to Kandahar or something. Yeah, yeah, to Kandahar, um, yeah. He followed me up. He called me and said, listen, I know Masood. This, the group that is holding them hostage is Masood's mm -hmm. group, and I can get the hostages released. So do you know anybody in the Indian government? So, I mean, why wouldn't I not help? Right. So I called my friend at the time, uh, Ashok Jaitley, mm -hmm. who was a senior civil servant. I knew him well. And um, Ashok said, yes, he'll get in touch with uh, the government, the minister in charge, right. just one thing. Just one thing, yeah. Yep. And he got in touch with just one thing. And he came back to me and said, we don't want to be associated with uh, civil killers' assistance, but give me his phone number. Ah, <laughs> keeping up public appearances. So, so by your measure, Charles Sobraj was involved. I'm, I'm absolutely certain that um, Sobraj was in touch with Masood. I am not certain that Jaswan Singh used Sobraj to talk to Masood. Sobraj to this day said that he got the hostages released. From your book, I we get all the stories about Charles Sobraj that haven't been told so far. What we have heard are highly romanticized versions of uh, the story. Yes. Right? Yes. Romanticized by himself, mainly. Yeah, yeah. Your book is very entertaining, and I dare say it's because Charles Sobraj kept you entertained yeah. all the time. <laughs> now, you could have walked away from him at any point in time, but as you say, you stayed out of curiosity. But do I also detect an undercurrent of fascination? Uh, there was a kind of fascination only... Uh, it was a fascination about fascination. I didn't understand how anybody could be fascinated by him. So I was fascinated by the fact that others were fascinated by him, if you see what I mean. Totally. Because if you ask me, you know, if I was... Uh, if I was the god of karma and Charles Sobraj turned up, you'd say, what would you cast this fellow as? And I'd say he'd be a tailor's assistant, Master G's assistant in Khan Market in Delhi, you know, with a tape measuring people saying so-and-so waste, so-and-so. And, -so waste, so -and, -so and not this Casanova, Lothario, Absolutely seductor of women. Not. The, in, the, in The Serpent, a very, very attractive actor charismatic actor played him, right? Even Randeep Huda dressed up, looks quite good. Charles is not, you know, Charles in reality may fancy himself as, he's not bad looking, right? But I can't see that woman after woman would fall for him. I mean, what the hell is wrong with me then? You know, um, <laughs> I think what, what it was with him is, the kind of women who are fascinated by somebody who has a power over life and death. I've heard of them. Or feels that they are, you know, they are so callous that they don't care about killing. Yeah, it is strange. Why do they do that? Yeah. Weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, as the story progresses, yeah. you have Charles Sobrach morph from a petty crook into an international criminal. 
And to me, the climax of the book is when you have Boris Johnson arriving on a bicycle to meet Charles O'Brudge. And Boris Johnson, of course, wasn't a prime minister. He was an editor of Spectator, wasn't he? What's the story? He called me one day and said, Falk, do you know anybody in the CIA? That was O'Brudge. And I said, how the fuck would I know anybody in the CIA, for God's sake? Then it struck me, one, why does he want to know the CIA? And two, I do know somebody in the CIA. Because in Channel mm-hmm. 4, I had a colleague called John Ranella. And huh? John Ranella had written a history of the CIA, a big fat book. Obviously, mm-hmm. he'd written a history of the CIA. He knew lots of people in the CIA. Of course, of course. So I called John. So would you like to meet Charles O'Raj? He said, the murderer? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I called Charles from Paris. I said, yes, I can introduce you to somebody who can introduce you to the CIA. So we drove to Grantchester, where John lives. Right. And they talked. And it's only later, he wouldn't tell me why. Right. It's only later on I found out that he was running with some partners this uh, arms dealing mm-hmm. from the ex Soviet dubs. Right. Belarus or possibly Ukraine. Mm -hmm. or Kazakhstan, or Turkmenistan, I don't know. They were ex-Soviet armament dumps, which which Russia hadn't taken back after the Soviet Union collapsed. Mm -hmm. Um, And they were from San Marino. That's uh, some free port in Italy. Yeah, a tiny republic. Yeah, they were selling these arms to the Taliban and so on. And I believe the, the Masood connection uh, helped him sell to the Taliban. As they say, it's not what you know, but who you know. <laughs> now, people are puzzled that Charles Sobraj decided to go to Nepal. Now, he got arrested and he's still there. Yes. You know why he went. Wasn't merely hubris. No, uh, the book tells you why, quite clearly why he went there. It does. Startling. But no spoilers here. <laughs> and the serpent in the Netflix didn't tell the whole story. Yeah. At the, at the end, at the end of the Serpent series, it says no one knows why he went to Kathmandu and took the risk. Wrong. I know why he went. Yes, and it's in the book. And I've written it in the book. Moving on from Sobraj, let's yeah. talk about Fragments Against My Ruin, your memoirs. My autobiography, sort of, yeah. Autobiography. The most compelling part of that book for me was your descriptions of your years as a political activist, British Black Panthers and Marxist-orientated activity. Indeed. Two personalities figure significantly in the book. One is uh, C.L.R. James and Darkus Howe. Was their influence on you deep? Uh, I think C.L.R. James, uh, I came to realize that uh, my interpretation of what's going on Mm -hmm. in the modern world with through a kind of Marxist prism, because I had read Marx mm-hmm. in my earlier days, uh, you know, right. student days, etc., um, was quite addicted to Marxist theory. Was never, was never under the illusion that Lenin was a communist, or that Mao mm-hmm. Zedong mm-hmm. was a communist, or that Stalin was a communist. You know, the word has just been right. absolutely abused. I mean, if they were communists, right. then. I'm the Queen of Sheba, right? And sure. you can call me Your Majesty. Uh, <laughs> but the interpretation of Marx, that the closest person to that interpretation was not uh, Althusser and Gramsci, right? Mm-hmm. Who also wrote about it. Right. But to my mind, C.L.R. James, yeah? And his right. kind of, his way of putting things fascinated me. And yes, I did learn from him. As far as Darkus is concerned, we had a kind of symbiosis. I don't know if I learned okay. anything from him, except okay. how to simplify ideas and put them to a public. I did learn that from him. Because he would speak the most complex uh, socio-political ideas, but make it very simple for the audience he was addressing. And he could do that. It's fascinating. That is a skill. Yeah. But no less fascinating is your ability to take important intellectual occurrences in your life and turn them into escapades. 
Ramji, it's stories. It's stories, you tell stories. Right, but some people yeah. can tell more interesting stories, clearly. <laughs> I mean, that bit about how you spirited away all the office... <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. You spirited away all the office furniture of uh, Shivanandans, and when he came back, there was, the next morning, there was he nothing there. Nothing was there, yes. <laughs> because we had to move, you know, because Shivanandan and gang... I mean, they might have been uh, well-intentioned, but they were very theoretical. They never participated in anything. They wrote about race and class and class and race, and, you know, every second thing was race and class, and so what? How did you cut off an entire office? I owned a pretty decrepit old post office van. It was dark green in color, and pretty rattly. I bought it for thirty-five pounds, uh, which was expensive at the time. And you know, it had opening doors at the back and quite a lot of capacity. So we turned up about five or six of us from the race to the collective, as we called it, turned up there and emptied the whole office <laughs> of, of typewriters. No, no, no computers at the time. You know, this was nineteen sixty-four. So. Uh, electric typewriters, uh, copy machines, fax machines, this, that, and the other. And the place, we emptied the place out. You called the Institute for Race Relations, and I quote, a factory yeah. for academic complaint. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very funny. You also made the comment that victimhood was the mantle of losers. And speaking of mantles, the millennial generation has been criticized as having no real agenda. Except uh, 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 verbal battles, you know, verbal revolution. Right. You can't say this, you can't say that. You have, to use, Absolutely. you have to use plural pronouns for his and her and bullshit, right? They want to use verbal revolution gets you, gets society nowhere. Yeah. Of right. course, it could alleviate insult to some people. Don't use mm -hmm. the N-word, right? Sure, uh, sure. Don't use the C-word in front of women. <laughs> you can mm -hmm. do it amongst your drunken friends. Inevitably, the backlash against too much wokeness <laughs> yeah. in your career, you didn't start out as a writer, you became one. At a dinner, you told Lawrence Durrell that the Alexandria Quartet was your principal influence, yes. and it saved you from being a scientist. Chemical engineer. With a background in quantum physics? Yes, yes. In, in Cambridge, yeah. And you passed on a job offer from the Atomic Energy Commission in India. Atomic Energy Commission of India wrote to me saying, congratulations on your physics degree from Cambridge. Uh, would you like to come and work for us? We'd be honored, blah, blah. And at the time, Indira was making a nuclear bomb, right? And I was a pacifist and a socialist and all sorts of things, right? And I thought, damn that, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go back to India and work for the Atomic Energy Commission. Good thing, though, for us that you refuse to go make nuclear bombs. Now, in Fragments, you write that it is not possible to actually assess a writer's motives without knowing something of his early development. Now, Fragments gave me the opportunity to know something about your early development, having been a long-time reader of Farooq Dondi. <laughs> you know, so, uh, so did you enjoy yeah. writing the book? Of course, I, I loved writing it. But, you know, one of the books that, that does delve into my childhood, or the people I knew, not myself, is uh, one of my earlier books called Puna Company. Yeah, the Puna Company talks about all the people I knew in my my very mixed cultural neighborhood. You know, Sindhi right. neighbors, uh, Parsis opposite, uh, uh, Muslims down the road. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, quite a Parsi neighborhood, but with a lot of uh, other people there, Christians, all sorts. Uncle Frankie, yeah, who used to make. Illicit booze. He's always called Frankie. For Uncle Frankie, reason. yes. I don't know why. That was... <laughs> you reveal in your book that you wrote the screenplay for Bandit Queen. Yes. You aren't officially credited. I can't. I couldn't take the credit for Bandit Queen. Right. Because my ex-wife, Mala Sen, wrote the mm -hmm. book Bandit Queen. Yes. Right. Based on which the movie was made. Yes. Based on which the movie was made. She interviewed 
Chaturvedi, the, the, the policeman, she interviewed uh, Fulan Devi, she interviewed Fulan's family, and she wrote the book. We then said, uh, uh, let's make a film out of this, right? It's perfect for a film. So as a commissioning editor at Channel 4, I commissioned the development of the film. I said to Mala, turn it into a screenplay. Mala didn't know how to write a screenplay. At Channel 4, you had to ask for budgets. And so my boss, Michael Grade, had put aside in my budgets, in my budget allocations, a million pounds for the film called Bandit Queen. Yeah. Wow, that's cool. So he calls me one day and says, listen, how far have we got with Bandit Queen? Uh -huh. So I said, what do you mean? So he said, well, you don't seem to have a director. You don't seem to have a producer. You don't seem to have a script, right? You don't seem to have any actors. I think I'll take the million pounds back and give it to another department. Ouch. So I thought, no, no, no. I said, I've got all those things. So he said, okay, can I read the script? So I said, uh, I'm going through an editing process just now with it, with the director. I lied. <laughs> yeah. I tell my colleague this story. She says, my parents own a house in Bordeaux in France. Here's the key. Take 10 days off and go and write it. So I took 10 days off, off Channel 4, left my to my assistant and buggered off with Bobby and other people. We went to this chateau, the ch this uh, cottage in Bordeaux. They would go out to the chateau and drink wine and whatnot. I would stay on the bloody typewriter and bash away. So in 10 days' time, that script, the script was done, and I could give it to – I couldn't put my name on it. There you have it, Farooq. That's what I mean by escapades. Yeah. And finally, to coin a cliché, what's next for Farooq Dondi? The, there's a novel called Tibetan Gospel. What is it about? What's it about? Well, you know, some people say that Jesus Christ is buried in Srinagar. Right? Yes, I've heard. Yeah, and people turn up to the shrine by their thousands to play it up. Now, um, I had a childhood friend, a real guy called Dara Kama. Darayas Kama. He was my, yeah, he's no longer. But um, Darayas turned himself in, he converted to Christianity, to Catholicism in London. And I've used him. He became Father Francis, right? And I've used him and his background. And what happens is it begins with the Pope calls him and says, listen, we can't allow this story of Jesus Christ being buried in, in Srinagar um, to go ahead because if he is, then Christianity doesn't exist. Yeah, because Jesus Christ died on the cross, went to heaven, was resurrected, was res you know was buried was went to heaven was resurrected came back saved mankind and he was buried in bloody uh, Kashmir. So you are an Indian, he says to Dara. Um, go and check it out. Go and check out the truth of this story and debunk it, please. Did you? So I didn't, but um, I imagined it's a fiction that Dara went. He goes to Srinagar and he gets an anonymous note, and then he goes to the uh, he goes to the monastery where somebody in the first century AD did turn up and did preach the Christian gospel, right? And so he looks at the old documents through somebody. Uh, it's a big, big intrigue. So that's the story. Tibetan gospel is called. Yeah, let's see. Seems fascinating. Can't wait for it to come out. I'll send it to you when it's published. There's, there's ups and downs in its publication. But if anybody listening to this podcast wants to publish it, please get in touch. <laughs> now, there are links in the podcast description as to where you can buy Hawk and Hyena good. and another link for Fragments. Good, good. And should anyone want to get in touch with Farooq, write to us and we'll get you going. Great. <laughs> yes. 
Well, I do happen to know that many publishing houses in India and abroad listen to us regularly. So I hope this fascinating book gets published soon. My agent will send it out again. So Great. And now we will have Farooq Dondi reading from the epilogue of Hawk and Hyena. But before we go, Farooq, you are someone that I have read for decades and always wanted to meet and speak with. <laughs> Farooq Dondi, thank you so much for being my guest today on The Literary City. Thank you very much. Proud to be here. Less frequently and perfectly legitimately, I am asked why I went along and perhaps even played along with his seemingly outrageous schemes or demands. If I ask myself this, the answer is quite sincerely curiosity. One doesn't encounter serial killers every day. Yes, there was always the professional potential of writing about him or extracting some confession or repentance for his past, not in any priestly enthusiasm, but to turn it into a film or a story. However shameful that may sound, it's the truth. There were other incidents, which I hope understandably stimulated curiosity by seeming intriguing or bizarre. What would he do with an introduction to the CIA? Why? Some were just ludicrous. His asking me for hot air balloons from his Kathmandu prison. Then there was the incident in which he asked for a connection to the Indian government to intervene to make a deal to save hostages held in the Indian Airlines plane in Kandahar. If he could save the lives of hundreds of hostages, why would I not put him in touch with any avenue of access to the minister who was negotiating with the hostage takers? As for refusing to help him set up his money laundering attempt and refusing to provide him with an antique furniture front for legal, lethal arms dealing, I'm acutely aware that I knew I had been asked to participate in international crime and declined. Could I have stopped international arms sales to terrorists? The answer is no. Shying away from ridicule is my only defense. Sobraj and his lawyers knew that prose works written by Richard Neville or anyone else, even if they purport to be accounts of events related by Charles himself, can't be used as evidence in law. Subraj can always say, this is a pure invention by the writer. In the case of this account, I have the strong feeling that Charles wants the story of his introduction to the CIA and his possible intention to betray the processes and mechanisms of arms dealing by terrorist groups to the agency told by someone other than himself. He perhaps calculates that even now, it may act as a starting point of considerations towards his release. I was there and have written it, I believe, as it was. And that was the amazing Farooq Dondi. What a way to begin season two. And I'll be back with that fun segment, What's That Word? What does P represent? A letter of the alphabet, a small round vegetable, considerable relief, or a co-host on What's That Word? <laughs> Hello, my name is Pranati, but you can call me P. That's P with an A, not another E. Hello, P with an A. What's new? Season two is new. Yes, we made it through season one, didn't we? Yeah, and flying. I mean, what great guests, what lovely interviews. People love this show. People? All the people? <laughs> All enough. <laughs> All enough. <laughs> <laughs> and what a great start to season two. Farooq Dondi. Great interview, by the way. Oh, thank you. It was a real treat to talk to him. You've spoken of him so often. You know, not only for his prose, but also for who he is. You know, when... <laughs> When Prince Charles apparently asked him why the Parsi population was dwindling, he replied that it was because of the community's sexual inclinations. <laughs> <laughs> Such irreverence. <laughs> and he reportedly told Julie Andrews, you teach me Indian politics, I'll teach you acting. That couldn't have been sound of music to her ears. <laughs> sound of music. 
<laughs> and there's there's also quite a bit of frat boy humor in his in his writing. <laughs> really? Like? Well, you know, Western names that you can twist into pretty risque stuff, like Rosemary Marlowe, the name, Rosemary mm-hmm. Marlowe. Pronounce it with a stress on each of its four syllables, and then you can blush in Urdu. Uh, Rosemary Marlowe. <laughs> I get it. I get it now. <laughs> well, don't translate it now. Okay, P with an A, what's that word? Undies in a twist. You used that <laughs> phrase. Yes, I did. <laughs> About Charles Sobraj and the world's nation's reactions to him. Yeah. I know having one's panties in a twist means being upset about something. But let's go. Dish on the meaning and etymology. Okay. So this phrase is commonly used in the UK and also in America. And we use it pretty common too, don't we? I mean, in conversation. Mm -hmm. But first of all, there are some variations on the theme. So there's undies in a twist, panties in a bunch, knickers in a knot or panties in a wad. So basically, you can call the garment undies, panties, or knickers, and you can get them to be in a twist, bunch, wad, or a knot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how versatile that phrase. In essence, it means getting upset about something trivial, much ado about nothing, you know? Mm, right. And its etymology? Fairly recent, as can be expected. So... Twisted clothing was a metaphor for mental confusion, right? Mm -hmm. So first, the English novelist George Eliot, whose real name was Mary Ann Evans, used this image in her Romola, where a character had to walk through fire so as to prove the divine origin of his doctrine. So she said of the poor guy, thou hast got thy legs into twisted hosts. Mm. H O S E, not H O E S. And the earliest occurrence of the phrase in its the form that we know it today was in the comic strip Andy Cap by British uh, creator Reginald Smith. Uh, as a as a kid, I used to read those Andy Cap comics about this ne'er do well character, you know, always with a cigarette and a slouching kind of demeanor, always a loser. And in the comic, the rent collector is banging on Andy Cap's door as he is prone to doing, Mm -hmm. demanding to know how Andy Cap can afford to drink brandy but can't pay his rent. Mm. And Andy Cap replies, relax, don't get your knickers in a twist, mate. I haven't paid for this brandy either. (laughs) (laughs) Knickers is such a funny word. It's British, right? Well, uh, the Oxford, I think it's the Oxford Dictionary, calls it chiefly British. But it has been known to be used uh, in other places as well. But knickers essentially means women's undergarments. You know, the old time, the old time ones used to be knee length and very, very modest and quite appropriate for beachwear, I'll say. (laughs) And, And then in America, the word used to describe those loose breeches that were used in sporting activity. You know how they were? They would get tight at the knees, but... They would like balloon out over the thighs. Right. Those those breeches, right? They were called knickerbockers. Right. And in in eighteen oh nine, the famous Washington Irving was writing under the uh, pen name for a Dutchman called Diedrich Knickerbocker. Used the word knickerbockers to refer to old wealth New Yorkers, probably because of their Dutch origins, and the name stuck in many many ways. For example, the basketball team, the New York Knicks is actually short for Knickerbockers. That's the team's name, really. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah, you play basketball, don't you? You used to play competitive basketball. Did you follow the team? Yeah, but not in Knickerbockers. (laughs) Well, well, anyway, I'm thinking of chicks wearing knickers, you know, the... You know those knickers with the long drawstrings? Don't you simply love period costumes? (laughs) No, thanks. I would have them (laughs) and myself in a twist in a second. And I would make much ado about nothing. Oh, oh, let me tell you another Farooq Dondi thing. You know that bit I told you about the name Rosemary Marlowe being something else in Urdu? Mm, Yeah. 
Well, he called the resulting furor over that usage much ado about nothing. (laughs) And that's our show, folks. Thank you so much for being here. Till next time, stay safe and read books. (laughs) 